A reading from the book of Acts. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man sitting, standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears, and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 31, selected verses therefrom. Um, it's found on page 740 in the Book of Alternative Services. The verses we're doing are 1 to 5 and 5, 15 to 16. The refrain is printed on the first, the inside flock of your bulletin. It is, I trust in you. You are my God. We will read the psalm responsibly, uh, breaking at the asterisk. Though rejected by mortals, 
yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it says in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you, then, who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and the stone that makes them stumble, and the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word of God, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. Our bright will hymn today is hymn number 551, My Faith Will Sum to Thee. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 prior to the gospel and 3 and 4 following. According to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way of the place that I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, for, from now on, you do know me, him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, 
and still you do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. In fact, will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father and will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If the name you, if you ask in my name, anything you ask, you will receive it. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. 
assurance of God's presence with us as God helps us to get a foothold to trust in the safety net of God's love. So, let's go on to our readings, in which we'll hear a bit about the stones. Well, let's start thinking about our first reading from the Acts of the Apostles, St. Stephen in the early church. <clears throat> Easter was a good few weeks back now, but in church, we're still in Easter season. For most of those post these post-Easter weeks, we haven't been hearing Old Testament ex excerpts other than our song, but rather from this book of the Acts of the Apostles, telling of the Apostles of Jesus in the time very soon after Jesus' resurrection and ascension to the Father, the time of the new and infant Christian church. They were on their own. And we hear of St. Stephen, one of the seven deacons, who were members elected by the early Christian church to minister to the community of believers in Jerusalem, to enable the apostles themselves to concentrate on prayer and the ministry of the word. They also, the deacons also were to support the needy in their community, and indeed that is the work that is delegated for the deacons in our church to this day, thousands of years later. Today's passage is the story of the martyrdom of Stephen. Here is some background. Peter and the other apostles have been imprisoned and beaten by temple authorities for preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. Meanwhile, thousands are being converted through the power of the Holy Spirit. These first Christians have sold all their possessions and hold all in common with the community of believers. They're all together as a, as a family. Stephen was a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and he, as we said, had been chosen to help distribute food to the faithful. And he caught attention by his words and his works. Jealous factions among the Jews in Jerusalem, the ones who were in charge of the temple and so on, accuse him of blasphemy, and they instigate false witnesses against him. They go and find people to give false testimony against him. He gives a rebuttal to that. It's a sermon about Israel's history of persecuting prophets. And that is in the book of the Acts. If you go and read the part before what you heard today, you will be able to read that. And that infuriates the high priests. And they drag him outside the city, just angry. They drag him out and quickly start to stone him to death. So Stephen becomes the church's first martyr. You may remember a reference in our gospel to a young man named Saul being present. Saul, of course, later was known as Paul. And that was a, a thing that he looked back on. These, all of these people were real people, and, and we've learned their stories and heard them so many times over the years. And this is a turning point in the book of Acts, setting the scene for more intense and violent persecution of Christians to come. And when we hear of the death of Stephen, we hear of a great contrast between the violence of the mob and the calm faith of Stephen, who prays for them as he dies. You may have noticed that as they threw stones, he responded, Stephen responded with words that parallel the same words that Luke places on the lips of Jesus as he's dying on the cross. He knew he was not alone. As of course Jesus always did too. So that's just a little bit about Stephen. Now a few words about a reading from the first letter of Peter, in which the idea of a cornerstone is prominent. So let's move ahead to that. In 1 Peter, a different kind of stone is mentioned. It's not a stone that kills, as with poor Stephen, not at all. It is the stone that caps the temple of God. The passage begins with the words, with words about longing for pure spiritual milk of salvation. Trusting in God's goodness, knowing that He is there for us. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> throat> 
The author then describes delightfully what are called the living stones chosen by God which form God's temple. For me, this brings delightful pictures to mind. Not that I can picture it exactly, but a temple, a place for the praise of God that's made of stones that are living stones, and those are us. What a wonderful, wonderful way to try to think of who we are together, and not just us, but all the people that have come before us in faith. So the, the author describes those living stones which form, which form God's temple. But we're also told here that in a, what would appear to be a reference to the resurrection, that there's a stone that the builders have rejected. God and this stone is the one that is Jesus. God has chosen to use this to complete the temple. Those who embrace the stone that God has chosen, that is, the Gentiles who have embraced the Messiahship of Jesus, are now called a chosen race, a, holy, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. It is apparent that the author of this letter is writing to Gentile Christians and saying to them, you are a new Israel, a new temple of God. You are the ones God has chosen. Once you are not a people, here he's probably referring to the Jewish people who have known that they are a people chosen by God for millennia. Once these Gentiles were not a people, but now they are too. Their whole destiny has changed because they embrace the one whom God chose to complete the spiritual temple. To us, a question is asked, are we ready to embrace this capstone, this Messiah, or will we toss it aside? So the idea of a chosen people is now wider and is now open. So that's something that we can get from that reading. Now let's move on to our Gospel. Our passage from John's Gospel is probably one you have recognized. It is set back before Easter. In fact, these words were spoken on Monday, Thursday. So we're way back at the Holy Week, now the day before, the night of the Last Supper and the day before his cru crucifixion. The words we heard were said by Jesus after Judas had left that dinner to betray him. After Jesus had told Peter that Peter was going to disown him three times. So it's immediately after that that our reading begins. And it is a reading of the world's discussion. I'll just skim over the words again to remind us. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to the place I am going. Jesus' words are meant to inspire hope and trust. My Father's house has many dwelling places. These encouraging words can be read as beautifully inclusive, as an assurance that God has space for different kinds of people in different kinds of places with different kinds of faith. A beautiful message of reconciliation. But, and there's so much in these passages to provoke discussion, but John's count goes on. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. In other words, have seen him in Jesus. So here, only a few short verses later, is a start from start an illustration of a dilemma that some people find in John's Gospel. Jesus now states that no one comes to the Father except through him. 
What does this mean? We've heard some of John's most beautiful poetry, revealing Jesus as the source of life, of abundance, of grace, and indeed revealing Jesus as the incarnation of God. I am the way and the truth and the life. If you know me, you'll know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you've seen him. Words that encapsulate John's message to his community. He is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. These words reiterate Jesus' message to his followers. You've known me, you've known God. We are one and the same. Words meant to inspire confidence and trust. But what about that statement? And I go back to that because it's one that people talk about a lot. No one comes to the Father except through me. We can probably explain what Jesus really meant, especially if we think of him as speaking here, specifically to those people in front of him who know him. What Jesus really meant might have been, you have everything you need to find your way to the Father. I am enough. Trust in me. That's what he's saying to them. Doesn't mean he's saying it doesn't apply to others. We're not told that. Nevertheless, Jesus' words, so that Jesus' words can be and often are read as exclusive. Jesus is the only means of salvation, the only way. Our reading continues as Jesus reiterates his message that he and the Father are one. With a conversation with Philip, Lord, show us the Father will be satisfied. And Jesus said, well, I've been with you all this time, and you still don't know me. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. So Jesus continues here teaching and reassuring his disciples that even though he's leaving them soon, they can be certain of his presence and his grace. Believe me that I am the Father and the Father is in me. The unity of God is deeply and mystically inspiring. And they also have been daunting and confusing in those days as today. <clears throat> the end of our reading, not the end of Jesus' words, but the end of our reading is Jesus saying, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask for anything, I will do it. So here again is another thing that might make us stop and think, hmm, I wonder about that. Jesus promises, if in my name you ask for anything, I'll do it. And maybe that's another statement that can lead us to be confused and disappointed, since all too often, our prayers are not answered, at least not answered in the way we expect and long for. We can explain, blame the person asking and say, you didn't ask for the right thing, saying that she just fails to recognize the real answer to the prayer. But we can still have confusion and frustration and anger when our requests seem to go unheard. Things are not clear. But you know, these are big topics, and life is messy, and we are always going to be challenged. But remember, Jesus assures us that if we know him, we know the one he calls Father. God is knowable because he's knowable, and he was real, and he was among us. What does this tell us about God? The God we know when Jesus Christ became flesh and dwelt among us, made a home among the poor, cared for the sick, lived in humility, fed the hungry, blessed children, washed the feet of his disciples, cried when his friend died, promised that death will not be victorious, and did many, many wonderful things. He also had anger in him. He could be angry when people were not doing things the way that they should. He was a full human. And fully God. <clears throat> and Jesus will come and take us to himself so that where he is, we may be also. So God is with us even in our vulnerability, our uncertainty, our failing, and our fear. Reach out, here is God. Take a step forward on the way, the path, 
our footing is sure, the path holds, and the way, the way that is Jesus, leads to life. You will not get lost, and God will not let you go. He is the way to peace and joy, no matter our circumstances. Following Jesus is not wasting or waste of time or a dead end road. So stay on the path and keep going. God gives us a way that's steadfast when everything around us feels like sinking sand or slippery or shifting. Because God has given us a person, Jesus, to be the way for us, to be the road. Remember in the opening verses of John's Gospel, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. <clears throat> but Jesus is that Word, and that Word was God, and we've been told that since the very beginning of this. I should never turn my pages on. It was politically incorrect. 
incorrect during his time, and is still politically incorrect now in the way people understand that expression. But that is because the phrase has been misinterpreted, both then and now. Let's for a moment assume that Jesus was God. Of course, we know that's true. This is this man's reason to try to get through to other people. So Jesus is God. What else are we talking about? God. We're taught that God is love. We're taught this endlessly in our scriptures. And all the law and the prophets hang upon that word, love. If you think about it in that context, an inter his interpretation of the I am and I am the way refers to love, as in, love is the way and the truth and the life. That Jesus is our Lord, that every moral, ethical, and social position as well as all daily priorities and decisions, right down to the ones, should be evaluated and determined on the basis of the way of Jesus. Jesus is our authority on how to live. It's much easier to believe the doctrine about Jesus and demand that others conform to it, which is what some people may try to do, than it is to actually embody the way of Jesus and love and accept others where they are. But the rewards also are amazing. If we go around and with every person we meet, we remember that Jesus is with us all the time, always beside us. And we see all of the people that we see through the eyes of Jesus. And we will make things better for them. And oh my goodness, the gift that that gives to us too. So life is going to be really difficult. It's going to have heartbreaking stuff in it. We're going to be sitting here on our side of the world looking at people being bombed, people starving, people dying of terrible diseases, and we're going to be broken inside because we can't do anything about that. What we can do something about is in every interaction that we have with other people, remember that God is beside us and make every little tiny decision in the light of that. We may live our lives locally among our friends, we may live a life that goes out farther and goes out on the world stage. But if we live our lives that way, then the world is a better place. And we're following the way that God wants us to follow. The way of love. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the person we should follow. And this, in every little decision, we follow his path of love and self giving then we help to build a more inclusive world and a more inclusive church at the same time. May God bless us all. Amen.
deal as is your custom. We're going to move things around a bit this morning. Reverend Tammy just handed me this book by Susan Sayers called Prayers of Intercession. And she said, it's really good. I had a quick look at the prayer for this Sunday, so that's what we're using. It fits so well with the readings you've just heard. The response is always, my strong rock and my shelter. So let's say that together. My strong rock and my shelter. We'll begin with some of the specific prayers. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we're praying for our primate, the most reverend of the Nichols, and our bishop, Sandra Fike. For Dartmouth, with St. George's, for Whit and the Reverend Nicholas Hack there, the Reverend Canon Harris, and also the parish of St. Margaret's of Scotland. In the North End Cycle of Prayer, we pray for Northwood. Now, this intercession. As living stones, let us pray for the building up of God's church and for the world God loves. Living God, our life is in your hands, and we offer you everything that we are, all that our past has made us, and all that we may become. Build us up by the power of your spirit into a spiritual temple, where you are glorified day after day in all our praise and worship and in our love for one another. You are my strong rock, and now my strong rock and my shepherd. Living God, our planet, with its frenzied life on its fragile skin, is unnervingly small and vulnerable to evil. Sharpen our conscience to sense your direction. Protect us from the other which draws us away from you. Guide our leaders in the way of truth. Realign us to the values which are built on you. You are my strong rock. My, my strong rock and my shelter. The living God, may the way which Jesus shows us be the way we live each day, around the table, in the daylight, in the dark, in the misunderstandings, sorry, in the misunderstandings, the tensions and the rush, in eye contact, in conversations, and growing old. You are my strong rock. My strong rock and my shepherd. Living God, you can use and transform all our experiences. We lay before you now those who are on their journey. Particularly today, we remember the sick, and you have the list in the bulletin. And we ask for special prayers for Michael Ray. For all those who are on their journey of whatever kind, we stand with them in their lives, and we offer it to you through your healing, transforming love. For you are my strong rock. My strong rock and my shelter. Living God, we remember all who have died and pray for them now, those known to us and those known only to God. Lead them out of this pain of this world into the light of eternity. Keep us in the way that leads us to share everlasting life with you. For you are my strong rock. My strong rock and my shelter. Now, a special intercession that works very well for this Sunday. First, remembering the coronation that took place yesterday. That wonderful service where King Charles and Queen Camilla were celebrated and dedicated to serve in all sorts of ways. As the Archbishop said, they come, we come, not to be served, but to be served. I hope your hearts were raised as mine was with the magnificent sound of Handel's Zadok the Priest, which was actually written for the coronation of another king. Throughout the service, in a meaningful way, the coronation embraced 
diversity. I was so moved when the British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, who is of Indian background, and a devout Hindu, said he was honored and proud to read from the epistle of the Colossians. The king was greeted by faith leaders from all sorts of Christian denominations and from leaders of other faiths. People from different levels, different social levels, different racial groups, different nationalities, from inside Britain and from the Commonwealth and far beyond took part. And all of this, and I thought this was particularly wonderful, for me was embedded in British heritage and in the Anglican faith. And we all need to remember the strength, the real strength that's in those roots. And now those of us who are here at St. Mark's, I don't know if you know, but some of you know, this is a special day for a couple of people here. For Reverend Vivian and for Patty Hannon, Friday was their 50th wedding anniversary. And you get to celebrate a little bit with them and maybe sing happy anniversary if you want to. At the end of the service, and it's not going to be high key because I know the heavens don't want that, but we're going to have a little gathering at the back of the church with some special things to eat, and you can say happy anniversary then. So we're very pleased. Two things to celebrate today. And all this rests in God, who is my strong rock. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.
for you, O holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross, that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name.
blesses you with the strength and the courage to share that love with all of you. We pray this blessing in the name of God, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And I invite you to please be seated for a few short minutes.